Thank you for tuning in to TalkWad.com, the world's fastest growing internet radio network. Please check out all the other great shows on www.talkwad.com. Welcome, America, to AmendmentOneRadio.com, where your First Amendment rights are still safe to say what's on your mind. Good afternoon. It's 4.30, and my name is Catherine K. Guns. I have 15 years' experience of handling firearms, two years as a firearms dealer, and then one day I took a concealed weapons permit course, and in that three and a half hours, it completely changed my life and how I viewed firearms. Um, I learned more in that three and a half hours than I did in all the years that I had handled firearms. After that, that soon uh, inspired me to become a firearms instructor. I'm currently a range officer, and I enjoy t- teaching and learning every day. There's a few uh, subjects that I want to cover today, and that's how to acquire a Class Three firearm, um, a, a firearms trust, and then uh, let me see what else on there. Some uh, uh, some uh, interesting news about uh, let's see what's that say there. Ruger and Colt and a few other guys that are trying to keep up with the uh, supply and demand. So I got an email and I only briefly read over it, but the, that's uh, I'll read it to you guys. Anyways, this show is brought to you by sponsors and advertisers out there just like you. If you want to be a guest on our show, the studio call-in number is 727-493-2055. And then I wanted to thank Nolan from TalkWad Radio Network. Um, Awesome. This none of this can be done without him. He has opened up a studio over in Tampa as well. That's on the corner of a uh, Lime Ball and Dale, Dale Mabry. And it turns out that I think we have quite a few talk show hosts now. So you definitely have to check out the Talkwad Radio Network. And so th- how you do that to view um, the the shows, you go to www.talkwad.com, and that's t a l k w a d uh, dot com. And then you uh, pick out the subjects that you're interested in, like political or sports or comedy, and then it gives you a whole list of the uh, shows that are going on, and then you just pick from there, and uh, it's uh, definitely the modern era of listening to the radio, because you get to pick out what you want to listen and watch at any time that you choose to watch it, so I think that's an awesome thing. So uh, if you want to become a sponsor or an advertiser or even a guest on the show, you're more than welcome to do that. Um, So if you want to call in, too, again, that number is 727-493-2055. So, wow, it has been one heck of a weekend, and uh, it keeps changing every day. But so some very interesting news in this email that I got. It says, interesting status report from Valley Guns in West Virginia. Status of the gun industry attention F, uh, Facebook fans to follow the several important info updates about the status of the gun industry currently. So followed by an inventory update, we traveled to Texas for the industry meetings concerning the sorted shortages. And here's what we were told. Smith & Wesson is running at full capacity, making 300 plus guns a day, mainly M&P pistols, and they are unable to produce any more guns to help with the the shortages. So they're running at maximum capacity. Wow. And then Ruger plans to increase from 75% to 100% in the next 90 days. Uh, FNH, that's uh, 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 Fabrique Nationale, is moving from 50% production to 75% by February 1st and 100% by March 1st. Remington is maxed out. Uh, Armalite, maxed out. DPMS, and that's uh, the, uh, the Panther. Uh, can't get enough parts to produce any more product. Colt, production runs in cl- increasingly week- weekly, uh, bottlenecked by the bolt carriers. And isn't that the truth? Um, over at the range, we also design our own firearms as well. And uh, that's the only thing that's holding them back from uh, selling the firearm. They don't have the bolt casings so or the bolt carriers, my bad. <laughs> and then LWRC, which is top of the top in personal opinion, uh, making only the black guns and running at full capacity. They can't get enough of gun quality steel to make the barrels. And then Springfield Armory, the only company who can meet the demand but are running 30 and 45 days behind. As far as the ammunition goes, every caliber is now allocated. We are looking for a nationwide shortage of all calibers over the next nine months. 
All plants are produce, producing as much ammo as possible with 1 billion rounds produced weekly. Recap that again. 1 billion rounds produced weekly. And most, most is military, followed by uh, law enforcement. And then civil, civilians are third in line. Magpul is behind 1 million magazines. Uh, that's the uh, polymer mags that we get. So uh, Magpul is behind 1 million mags. Do not expect any large quantities of Magpul anytime soon. And to the notes to reloaders, all Remington, Winchester, CCI, federal primers are going to ammunition manufacturers first. There are no extras for reloading pur- uh, purposes. It could be six to nine months before they get caught up. So sorry for the bleak news, but uh, we know what to expect in the coming months. Stay tuned and we'll keep you posted. And uh, that's a really good friend of mine that uh, I don't know if he wants to be mentioned or not, but uh, he always sends me an email with updates. He's the one that uh, also sends me the recall notices and things like that. Uh, So he was uh, actually an instructor that uh, took the same course as I did. So I definitely recognize who it is, but I don't know if he knows who I am. (laughs) All righty. So what is an NFA gun trust? Well, that's helping individuals and their families educate and protect themselves from the unintentional violations of the NFA. The NFA stands for National Firearms uh, Associate, or uh, the, uh, let me see. It, it, that's exactly what it stands for, National Firearms uh, so, uh, Act, okay? So they're, they're the ones that uh, put the ban on the firearms and controlled it the way that they wanted to do it. So. What is an NFA, uh, National Firearms Act, gun trust? That's the legal, legal ownership, transfer, and possession of NFA firearms in most states. So what is it that I'm talking about? Well, that's the, the, uh, the firearms that are like the suppressors that silence it. Okay, so that's the, uh, the individual piece that you apply to the firearm to, to decrease the sound. Um, or it actually could be the barrel itself that's just... Uh, has the baffles and everything already put into it. Um, so that's silencers, short-barreled rifles, short-barreled shotguns, pre-1986 machine guns, destructive devices, and any other weapon. And I think it was back on my second or third show, we just described any other weapon being things like the ink pen guns, uh, destructive devices, uh, grenades, any other weapon. All righty. So what is an NFA gun trust? Uh, NFA firearms, also called the Title II firearms, are guns and other items regulated by the National Firearms Act, the NFA. Many people mistakenly refer to them as Class III firearms or weapons. So I learned something new. I had always referred to them as Class III weapons, but uh, (laughs) that's apparently not what it's called. It's called a Title II firearms. So... The NFA regulates that the sale, the use, and possession of transfer of machine guns, short-barreled shotguns and rifles, silencers, destructive devices, and any other weapons in most states, some of all of or all of these items are now legal to own in a sense, but you have to have a trust. So in, in addition to the state regulation, uh, federal law regulates that these items under the NF, uh, NFA so they regulate them, and the individuals of business entities, individuals, and trust are permitted to purchase NFA firearms if allowed by the state law. So this is how we do it. To obtain permission to transfer or make these items of the Bureau of, Al- uh, Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms and Explosives, or the BATF, or ATF, requires completion of a formal or Form 4 Oh, I'm sorry, a Form 1 or a Form 4, along with the payment of $200 for a tax stamp. While a traditional trust can be used to purchase NFA firearms, there are many problems with using traditional trust, and therefore only NFA gun trust should be used. So once an NFA gun trust is designed, an attorney who is licensed and under the proper state reviews the trust and forwards the trust to the client. The client reviews the instructions and the facts and has a phone consultation to discuss the questions or comments on the federal and state laws. If necessary, modifications are made and then all grantors and trustees sign the trust. 
Once the trust is properly executed, NF item, NFA items, that's the National Firearms Act items, the ones that are restricted, can be purchased. The entire process takes less than a week and often one to two days. Why do I need an NFA gun trust? And honestly, I don't want to tease you people out there. It only takes maybe one to two days or a week to purchase it, but you still don't get to take it home until the finishing uh, the tax stamp has been delivered to you. So just to give you a heads up, don't get too excited out there. This is actually a long process, but it is worth it. <laughs> so why do I need an NFA gun trust? Okay, so the uh, CLEO signature required, and the CLEO is the chief law enforcement officer, so no CLEO signature is required. The AF uh, ATF requires that all individuals obtain approval from their chief law enforcement officers as part of the application process to obtain a Title II firearm from other individuals or a Class III dealer. But many CLEOs around or uh, chief law enforcement officers around the county are refusing to sign or even acknowledge the ATF forms. So there is no legal remedy in most states to force the review of these forms. So in most states, the NFA Gun Trust does not require the CLEO's signature to obtain approval on a for Form 4. So no fingerprints or photographs are required when using an NFA Gun Trust to acquire Title II firearms. No fingerprints, no photographs are required. This is a cost savings, and it can also significantly decrease the time required to take possession of these items. Often fingerprints have to be retaken because they are not acceptable by the FBI's criminal database. Privacy of individuals who submit their ATF forms to their CLIO are often concerned about who will have the knowledge of their firearms. They also express concern that they will come under additional scrutiny because the police will have knowledge that they, have the, they are in possession of these more restricted firearms. Um, you know, just to backtrack and not go any further, I did have quite a few Class Three firearms with uh, two X's. <laughs> um, and the first one, we did have ATF come by, and we brew up a pot of coffee, you know, and we'd, we'd talk the talk, and, you know, they had to, to check to make sure all the documentation and paperwork's there. As long as you're in the legal right to own them, it's not really that difficult to go through this process. But I can understand why they're, uh, they, they're starting to express concerns with all the recent activity and the things that are going on. So um, th let's just face it. As long as you follow law, as it currently is right now, then you're doing the right thing. Any time that you choose to deviate from that is only going to make us look bad. And that sucks because I want to tell everybody to stand up for our Second Amendment rights and then stand up and, and do what they originally designed to do by filing the uh, Title II, you know, uh, forms to, to, to get your tax stamp to own these weapons. Um, I don't know how long it's going to stick around for, but I do know that once you wrap it up in a trust, Hopefully it shows that you're responsible and that you're the sole owner of the firearm. And then, uh, let's face it, these guys aren't, they're not necessarily cheap. So the bad guy generally doesn't get their hands on these. But the media and everybody, they blow it all up and it gets confusing. And I just want to clarify that a full automatic is extremely difficult to get. You're going to start at about $10,000 base price, okay, for a pre-86. Suppressors. Anything that's remotely any good is going to start at about a grand or more. I don't know if the prices have changed since the uh, uh, since of January, but uh, it it you know it's it's significantly different. I can tell you that. So, um, in most states, when using an NFA gun trust, neither the Clio nor the police are given the notice that you will be in possession of your NFA firearms. Incapa uh, uh, incapacity. If you become incapacitated, oh, I see, this is the, they've hit every angle on this. So if you become incapacitated, your family or friends are often the ones, ones to help you. In doing so, they might come in contact with the restricted items and put themselves at risk of violating the NFA uh, without knowledge. An NFA gun trust helps protect these individuals from uh, violating the NFA by providing them from clear instructions on what they are and what they are not permitted to do. Many normal trusts actually instruct people to break the law. So they're actually saying, get, 
get the proper lawyer to do the job to form these trusts up. Because I know a lot of people are actually in a panic right now going, I got to put it in a trust. You need to know what you're doing first. Okay. All right. So uh, if death should occur, when, when you die, your individually owned firearms will be a part of your probate estate. Uh, pro, the probate proceedings will be necessary to transfer your guns under your will to your heirs and part of the, it is part of public record. Since a family member or a friend usually handles probate proceedings, it is important to not, uh, not to unknowingly place them at risk of violating the National Firearms Act. With a nas- National Firearms Act gun trust, your firearms are not subject to probate or made part of this public record. Your beneficiaries will be protected because they will receive the guidance on how and under what circumstances the items can be legally transferred. If you have children, an NFA gun trust has specifically specific provisions to protect them and make sure that they do not receive the firearms if they live in a location where it is illegal to possess a National Firearms Act firearm. And it is important, uh, and most importantly, and a NFA gun trust can help, per, uh, help ensure that your children are mature and responsible enough that you would want them to have the firearms. Co-owners and authorized users. If an individual purchases a Title II firearms, then he or she is the only one permitted to use or have access to them. Many people incorrectly believe that is okay to let others use their National Firearms Act firearms when they are, are, are in their presence. However, the NFA would consider this, this a transfer and it would be a violation of the law. When your spouse or someone else knows the combination of your firearms safe, that you may be violating the law through the constructive possession. Improper possession through constructive possession is a form of an unimproved transfer in violation of the NFA. If you use an NFA gun trust to purchase the Title II firearms, you can designate additional owners and authorized users. So if you want to add or be cha- uh, change the users or owners of an NFA gun trust, uh, that can be adapted to reflect your current desires. The risk of constructive possession can be dealt with by adding that person to the NFA gun trust so that they can be in legal possession of the firearms. This can help protect you and your family from the penalties of violating the NFA. Wow, that was actually pretty important to know. (laughs) Um, Reducing the risk of legal changes. Many groups are attempting to limit the ability to transfer firearms to family members or friends. With a National Firearms Act gun trust, an an adult child, a family member, or a friend can be made a co-owner of the trust, while the ownership of the NFA gun trust can be changed. The NFA gun trust is still the regist- is the registered owner of the firearms and no transfer has taken place under the NFA. Penalties for violating the National Firearms Act can be severe. Each violation of the National Firearms Act are subjects to the owner to forfeiture of all weapons. 10 years in prison and fines up to 250,000. An NFA gun trust provides the guise, guidance to the creators, managers, and beneficiaries of the trust to help them avoid violating the NFA. Benefits of the NFA gun trust over a corporation or an LLC, because those are two other ways that you could actually do that, but um, I always suggest doing it through a, a gun trust, and now more specifically, Uh, National Firearms Act gun trust. So it's more specific and covers all bases. But, uh, you know, do this compared to a corporation or an LLC. Corporations and LLCs have annual fees associated with them. Business entities are not private or and so much and much information about the individuals associated with them is contained in public records. Corporations and LLCs have annual state fees and other costs associated with the maintenance of the entity. 
Often business entities are subject to the requirement to file sales tax and income tax returns. If you already have a business entity and used, uh, used it to purchase NFA firearms, the business is at risk if the managers or anyone else ever misuse a firearm. Each manager of the corporation or LLC can purchase firearms and subject to the entity to the, pen, uh, to the penalties for violating the NFA. To make a change to the people authorized to use, purchase, or possess the firearms, the Secretary of State needs to be updated with the changes to the management of the company. This can cost money and take a substantial time to complete. Business entities that do not deal with the incapacity or death like a NFA gun trust does. So let me read that again. Business entities do not deal with the incapacity or death like an NFA gun trust does. Okay. Unlike the corporation or LLC, the NFA gun trust does not require any annual recording fees or documents uh, that do not need to be filed with the state. To make a change to an NFA gun trust, one simply amends the trust to change who can use, purchase, or possess the firearms without the risk of criminal liability of violating an NFA benefits of an NFA gun trust over a revocable trust. Oh, wait. Did I? Without violating the NFA. Sorry, I ran the two sentences together. <laughs> I'm actually reading this because it's a lot going on there. So basically to back backtrack that, what it's saying is to make a change to a National Firearms Act gun trust, one simply amends the trust to change who can use or purchase or possess the firearms without the risk of criminal liability for violating the National Firearms Act. And then... Benefits of an NFA gun trust over a revocable trust. There are more than 50 differences between a traditional trust and an NFA gun trust. Only a few of these issues will be discussed here. Most of these trusts do not instruct how to purchase, who may use, or have may, who may have access to the Title II firearms. They also did not give the people involved with the trust enough information to properly sell or to transfer the assets. If you become in incapacitated, a normal trust may require the sale of your firearm or transfers to an ineligible individual or one who does not know the restrictions in these highly restricted firearms. When you die, these restrictions fire, restricted firearms need to be transferred properly and the only to those who can legally be able to be in possession of them. So an NFA gun trust provides information to determine if, number one, is it permissible to transfer all the items? Number two, the items are legal in the state where they were to be transferred to. Okay, some states just don't allow it. Okay, make sure that it goes to the legal state. <laughs> Number three, beneficiary is legally able to be in possession or the use of the firearms. And, you know, that it could be as simple as if that person ended up with a domestic violence uh, charge. And obviously, if they can't own a regular gun, they can't own a uh, class three firearm or sorry, title two firearm. <laughs> class three is actually the. Uh, the gun dealers that can, are allowed to uh, sell and, and, and have possession of Title II firearms. So I learned something new there. And then most importantly, number four, the successor trustee is given the ability to determine on their own when and if the beneficiary is mature and responsible enough to receive the firearms. A normal trust allows the trust to be revoked even if the assets become illegal upon revocation. Also, a normal trust allows a trustee to resign while they are still in possession of the restricted firearms. A trustee may also find that with a nor within a normal trust, an agent acting under the power of attorney may take actions that are in violation of the NFA and subject them to criminal penalties. So most people using traditional trust purchase NFA firearms incor incorrectly. They usually purchase them as an individual, then transfer the weapons into the trust. 
While the ATF may approve the transfer from dealer to the trust, they have never, ever approved an individual to transfer from the dealer nor transfer from the individual to the trust. Each of these is a violation of the National Firearms Act. That's why when I said when you start this and it says one to two days or within a week, no, it's sitting at the firearm store that has a Class 3 license and until you have filed the proper paperwork for your Title II weapon. Then that's when, when everything has got, its eye, all the I's are dotted and the T's are crossed and you have your tax stamp is when you can finally take possession of that, which is usually a six to nine month process. And it may even be longer now. <laughs> so many, fee, uh, many free trusts on the internet or from the sources have been found to be invalid. So you really need to pay attention to this. I, I foresee this being a uh, big problem in the future, okay? So many free trusts on the internet or from the other sources have been found to be invalid. Lately, we have seen many dealers and manufacturers providing trust to customers or helping them to fill out their trust in order to purchase the firearm, these firearms. The problem with using an invalid trust or one not signed correctly or a trust that is not, not complete is that the trust may not exist. If the trust doesn't exist, even if the ATF approves a transfer to the trust, you will be illegally in possession of the firearm and subject to penalties of the National Firearms Act. Even otherwise, valid trusts like a traditional estate planning trust or one from Intuit or LegalZoom, have been there have been substantial problems with dealing, dealing with the incapacity, death, or transfer of the firearms as they instruct the trustees to take steps to create liability to the beneficiary. Uh, put these assets at risk of seizure and put both trustees and beneficiary at risk of penalties of violating the uh, National Firearms Act. So you should seek legal advice from someone familiar with National Firearms Act and is not just someone who can create a trust. Because right now, there's a lot of people trying to jump on the bandwagon and sell these trusts, and uh, they might not know their butt from a hole in the ground, okay? You really need to pay attention to what you're doing here because the penalties are severe. Remember, I've talked about it a couple of times. They have this uh, dandy little law called the uh, RICO Act. So if you're in possession, that already said you could face up to 10 years in prison. They'll take your house because the gun was in the house they'll take your land because the house is on land and the gun was in the house they'll take your car because the car was probably the thing that was used to transport it home and anything and any anybody that could possibly be involved with it so that's how severe it is okay um let me see here let's backtrack a little bit a lawyer who recommends let me see Seek legal advice from someone familiar with National Firearms Act, and it is not just someone who can create a trust. A lawyer who recommends or supplies a traditional trust for National Firearms Act uh, uh, firearms may be committing legal malpractice, and many so-called gun trusts or trusts for the National Firearms Act firearms do not properly deal with the purchase, possession, and the use of National Firearms Act firearms. The copyrighted National Firearms Act Trust protects the firearms and those who are using or may be in possession of them from the penalties prescribed by the state laws and National Firearms Act. The National Firearms Act Gun Trust has been rewritten with these principles in mind. Um, and this is one that's, that this lawyer particularly is trying to sell. Um, and it's really easy to Google him and get this information because what I did to get this is I typed in uh, Class 3 firearms because I thought I was, you know, looking for Title II firearms, but I didn't know the name of it. And when I did that, um, it pulled up several documents. And then a, this one's in a very professional setting, and there's no mistaking it because it'll be almost word for word what I'm telling you, and that's the best hint I can get, I give to you. So. And, it, and his particular one is copyrighted. That's another way that you can look it up, is look it up under 
NFA Gun Trust. Okay, so it's copyrighted. It's particularly his. Okay, the NFA Gun Trust has been rewritten with these principles in mind. The trust instructs the grantors, trustees, trustees, successors, trustees, and the beneficiaries on the rights, duties, qualifications, and guides them through the proper way to purchase, use, and transfer the items under the state and federal regulations. Each NFA gun trust comes with a comprehensive instructional memorandum that covers how to purchase, transfer, use, share, transport, store the firearms, as well as how to use the trust based on the questions and feedback from the thousands of clients. So that's my little bit on how to acquire a Title II firearm. Um, boy, they, they're a whole lot of fun there. I had quite a few of them at one point in time, but a uh, sense of downsize, shall we say. <laughs> it's a lot easier to take care of my Colt, I can tell you that. All righty, so we've covered over, uh, you know, how hard Ruger, Colt, and all these manufacturers are trying to keep up with it. Then we covered how to... Uh, how to acquire an NFA uh, firearms uh, uh, gun trust. I wanted to cover over what I usually try to, what I usually end up kind of <laughs> saying to be continued. We'll cover over some of those things. What it was last week we were also talking about was um, firearm safety. And uh, I, I ended, uh, ended that show with covering some of the range, uh, range rules. And I just wanted to cover a few more of them because it's so very interesting. Uh, so I guess we can um, read through the first. I think it was. I think I got to probably number ten. So I'll read through those ten, and then we'll go on from there. That way we don't leave anybody hanging as to what it was that I was talking about. So the very first thing, as anybody goes to a gun range, um, me as a range officer, uh, I have my little uh, flight attendant speech, and uh, usually what I, I I ask as soon as they come in, the first thing I say is, uh, you know. Are you familiar with your firearms? And uh, they either say yes or no, but this determines what level they're at. at they're at. And then I ask them, have they ever been to this range before? And, uh, you know, whether they say yes or no on that. So it's usually, are you familiar with your firearms? Have you ever been here before? The next step would be, did you read the gun range rules? Then after that, I say, make sure that you have your eyes and ears on at all times. Only open up one door at a time because it's a sound barrier. Most gun ranges are like that indoors. They have a sound barrier because it creates, you know, muffles the sound down. <laughs> Alrighty. So when they get in there, then I make sure that where they uncase their firearm is at the shooter's bench. That's not the table. It's the shooter's bench. That's right where you're going to shoot at. Okay. So uncase and recase only there. And that includes your rifles and your rifle bags. They should be placed underneath the uh, shooter's bench table because it's not very wide. But um, that's where you uncase it, where you keep the gun downrange at all times, and then you put it up on the table where you're going to shoot at. This prevents firearms from crossing the floor. Because if It doesn't matter how experienced you are, how safe you think you are with your proper indexing and carrying the firearm. One rookie sees that, and we've got 12 lanes. We, you know... They, they, they pick up on bad habits, so I might end up with 12 inexperienced firearm people with guns traveling across the floor. So that's why I say even if you, you know, even if you think you're a pro at it, don't get cocky in a fire range, uh, in, in, at a range, you know. Um, we're constantly trying to, to, to keep it as safe as possible because it is very dangerous with live fire. So anyway, so obviously you uncase it only at the shooter's bench. And then we recase only at the shooter's bench with the firearm still facing downrange because the gun is what? Always loaded, okay? That falls along those three firearm safety rules, which most people know, hopefully, that we always keep the gun pointed in a safe direction. <laughs> downrange, okay? Always keep your finger off the trigger until ready to shoot. That's that indexing. Whether it be a rifle or a handgun, the trigger finger stays alongside the frame, okay? And then always keep the gun unloaded until ready to use, okay? So it mainly goes for uh, uh, safety at your house. If you're un not attending to the firearm, you want to prevent access by any unauthorized people. And an unauthorized person is anybody but you. So obviously, if you're at work and your gun's at home, it should be locked up, ammunition kept separately. The same thing goes for a gun range. When you go into a gun range, we prefer that your gun be in a case, okay? Not 
carried upon you, okay, as, as a concealed firearm, that's potentially dangerous because uh, if you plan to shoot the firearm at the gun range and you unconceal it from your shirt, it's it's no longer concealed. I, I, I don't know the best. It causes a panic in a gun store, shall we say, because most of us do it the way that the usually the sign on the door says, unloaded firearms must be carried in a case to shoot at the range. I have occasionally seen people literally pull up their shirt and pull their loaded firearm out of their shirt uh, for a concealed state. Don't do that, okay? All righty. So um, after I give them the flight attendant speech of where to uncase their firearm and uh, the, the firearm safety rules if they're a rookie, usually if they've been experienced, I give them the short version of this, so please uh, uncase only at the shooter's bench and recase only there. And sweep up your brass when you're done. <laughs> but uh, uh, the, the ones that uh, need a little bit of help along, I also want to mention to them that you don't ever, ever pass a firearm person to person. You lay the firearm down, and you step back, and you let the next person into the bench to shoot. You don't pass a firearm person to person because it takes it out of that safe, safe direction, okay? Then... Um, Obviously, obviously, there's no eating, drinking, or chewing of gum out there because you're going to expose yourself to more lead than need be. Um, and that, that's kind of the, the, my flight attendant speech. So then uh, to go over these, um, obviously, keep your firearm pointed in a safe direction. Keep your finger off the trigger. Keep your firearm unloaded until ready to use. Treat every firearm as if they were loaded. Um, the best way to load and unload your firearms, semi-automatic to load it. You drop the magazine, you load it, you put it into the firearm, which is in the magazine well. See what we talked about terminology is kind of important to know. So you take your magazine, you load the ammunition into it, take the magazine and put it into the firearm well, which is on the bottom of the firearm. Then you rack the slide, and then the firearm is ready to use. Sometimes there is a safety on there. Red means that it's ready to fire, and white usually means safe. Um, and, and another tip to learn is learn how the safety works on the firearm. Um, the safety usually, there's a notch in the slide, so if it's up, the slide is not able to move. And if it's down, the slide is able to, to perform its action, and therefore the safety would be off if the slide could go back. But every firearm is unique and a little bit different. And then um, to unload a semi-automatic, you guys have got to remember that you have to drop the magazine first, and this is a two-step process. You drop the magazine first, and then you rack the slide to take out any remainder uh, ammunition. Um, and then you would use the slide lock to hold the slide back and lay the firearm down. That way, anybody else could look visually without having to touch the firearm and see that it uh, verify that it's unloaded. Revolvers are a lot more simpler. <laughs> to load a revolver, you push the or or push or pull the release latch on the cylinder if you tip it out you either put five six ten plus shots in there um, of, of ammunition so like a 22 would be like 10 to 12 you can put in there obviously 38 specials would be about five to six shots or rounds of ammunition then you close the cylinder um, and then you got to sometimes wiggle the uh, uh, cylinder to to lock into place so that when you're ready to fire um, you're able to. To unload it, you must take advantage of your ejector rod. So to unload a revolver, obviously you push the cylinder release latch. You tip the cylinder out, keeping the gun in a safe direction. Then you take advantage of the ejector rod by tapping on the rear of that, and that will cause the, the uh, uh, shell casings or full ammunition to be extracted from the firearm while keeping it in a safe direction. So that uh, I know you probably, anybody that's an avid viewer has probably heard, heard me say that a few times, uh, but I get new viewers all the time, and I just thought it was important to repeat it a few more times, you know? So, uh, no, under, no persons under the influence of alcohol or drugs shall be allowed on the range. I mean, that's kind of common sense. Um, safety glasses and hearing aid, uh, and hearing protection uh, is a must. Um, when you're shooting indoors, it's a lot different from shooting outdoors. Uh, shooting indoors... Um, it's like shooting in a tin can. So that's why, you know, I've had people say to me, you know, I don't want to wear those and I've got these little earbuds. It's not enough for us and we want to be able to visually see that you got your ear, uh, earmuffs on. So you can double up, okay? Um, all firearms should be at the bench area only and that's right where you're going to shoot at. All firearms with both hands on the firearm. Um, 
if 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 you're under training, um, some instructors will actually ask you to do or perform a one arm shot. I generally don't do that for newbies, and the only reason why I don't do that to newbies is because it's taking all of their concentration to handle the firearm with two hands. Um, and you got to think about when you shoot with one hand, you're taking uh, that amount of recoil that once was pushed on both hands all in one. So uh, to any firearms instructor out there, come on, use your common sense. Don't do that to them because they're more than likely going to drop the firearm. Um, so never go in front of the firing line unless, it, uh, unless the line has been declared safe or as we call a cold range. Um, it's happened to me a couple of times at the range. And uh, what we do when we call a cold range, and the reason why we usually call a cold range is either a part of a firearm has went down range or a target has gotten stuck or we have to do some repairs. So we call a cold range. And what you're supposed to do is lay your firearm down. And the if it's a semi-automatic, the slide is back and the ammunition is taken out and then laid down in a safe direction. Revolver is the same way. The cylinder is out. Ammunition is out of it. It's laid in a safe direction. Um, rifles, the same way. The bolt or the uh, magazine is out of it or uh, however it's put back into a safe position where you can visually see that it's clear. And then you have to physically step back from the firearm, okay? Because we know that um, the only way the gun is going to fire is if you're, you know, behind it doing something foolish. The gun won't fire by itself. So that's why we separate man and the firearm, okay? Then we're able to go down range because we're going down the uh, business end of the uh, uh, range to uh, repair or fix whatever we got. So it's really important that you greatly respect that. It has happened to me a couple of times where I was just supervising and my guys went down range to make a repair and some idiot would go and fiddle with his firearm and I barked pretty harshly at him. Well, I take it very, very seriously. So um, I don't care if I hurt his feelings or not. So, and usually when they get into cocky attitude, it's all about ego. Well, you know what? Be safe about firearms. If you've got an ego, ego should never get in the way of firearms. So you get over it because you need to be safe with them, okay? I don't care if I hurt your feelings. <laughs> So, obviously, uh, never leave the range until the firearm instructor has inspected your firearms. That's usually also, or the range officer will inspect your firearms. Some ranges do it, some don't. I think it would be safer that way if they also helped verify so that, you know, it's a second person verifying your firearm. Um, before shooting, whether you're at an indoor range or even an outdoor range, please be sure or aware of your target, the backstop, and the surroundings beyond. Um, Ammunition can travel quite a distance, and, and these outdoor, where you're shooting outdoors, you need to definitely make sure you have a backstop of some sort, um, because ammunition can fly a couple of miles or even more, could penetrate a car in a neighbor's yard, a house, um, you know, just because you can't see that far doesn't mean it won't travel that far, so that's what they're trying to say. If your firearm fails to fire, keep it pointed downrange and immediately notify the firearms instructor. Um, either by saying, you know, something, or usually the, if the firearm instructor is paying attention, then we'll notice it right away. If you're an experienced person at this, you know that at the range, um, it depends on what method we're practicing. It could be just uh, practicing for competition and uh, or just learning to improve your shot. In the beginning, you want to learn the wait the 30 seconds because um, it's not you're not able to determine whether it's a misfire or a hang fire. Um, in competition or self-defense, we learn the method called tap and rack. But you have to do this in order. If you're a rookie, learn first, wait the 30 seconds, the speed will come later. And then you'll deal with that later. But first you have to train yourself to understand why it is the way that we're doing it. Kind of like the uh, karate movie, you know, wax on, wax off. And he didn't understand why he had to learn that. And later it all clicked together and explained it. And that's kind of how it, it, it comes into place there, okay? All right, so uh, no tobacco chewing or smoking allowed on the fire alarm, <laughs> fire in line. I can't believe I just read that. That is uh, <laughs> obviously you're dealing with gunpowder, guys. <laughs> That's kind of funny. Um, anyone who is unsafe or illegally modified a firearm will be stri strictly prohibited on the range. Obviously, um, that would be the bad guy, okay? Or anyone who is unsafe with a firearm. I have jousted a few people out of there because of their unsafe behavior and uh, we need to be aware of it 
people also that are going out there, you need to be aware of your surroundings as well. Just be just because you know that you're being safe and you're practicing and all of it doesn't mean that the person beside you, whether it's indoor, or outdoor, wherever the place may be that you're shooting, make sure they're being safe too. Be aware of your surroundings. And if they're behaving unsafely, don't be afraid to offer help to treat, teach them the safe way. And if they're being cocky about it, don't be afraid to become a little more assertive with how serious it is. Usually that'll back them down. I mean, don't scream and yell, but be assertive on, dude, what are you doing? Okay. Or remove yourself from the environment. Okay. Uh, usually people that are professional with firearms, you know, sometimes we slip up here and there. We're not being a hundred percent focused and, and, and sometimes need a little barking or correcting. And, uh, hopefully they're not behaving in such a severe way that it could cost somebody their life. Okay. So, uh, we've covered over the ceasefire. That's usually also the cold range too. Okay. And then here's a biggie guys, um, or gals, <laughs> If you're pregnant, you must notify the firearms instructor and you cannot go to it. You might not be able to go to the range. Um, an indoor range, the levels of lead are extremely high. Believe it or not, right now, I've only been working at the range that I've been working at since, uh, I think, August. My lead levels are sitting at 27%. The, uh, it's funny what uh, lead will do to you. Um, the highest percentage is at 40%. So you can see 27 is sitting pretty high. Um, it'll mess with your memory and it'll give you stomach aches. It can make you really, really sick. You wouldn't be able to sleep. <laughs> Somebody actually opened the door and then uh, the techie is looking at me saying, I don't know who that was or what that was about. You know, I completely ignored him and, and I don't think I missed a beat until now. <laughs> but uh, so anyway, so if you're pregnant, um, not advisable to go to a gun range and most gun ranges will tell you not to, and so those that think they say, well, maybe I just won't tell them I'm pregnant this time, please be aware of that. Lead, lead can really mess you up, and then you'll have to go through chelation treatments and all kinds of crazy stuff, so um, pretty serious there. Always wash your hands with cold water after shooting. Be aware that the airborne particulate lead dust from the ammunition is being fired, so you need to, to wash your hands with cold water. Um, the reason why we don't wash it with hot is because it opens up the pores and uh, then lead can sink in, okay? Any check, uh, uh, and any, oh, <laughs> that last one was uh, about the firearms. Any check that was returned um, <laughs> would su be subject to a $35 uh, charge. That's for, uh, you know, teachers, so. Alrighty. So, um, that's pretty much well what it said for the the gun range rules um and i've covered how to load and unload a firearm safely and uh some of the general rules at the range um there really isn't a, a whole lot to, a whole lot more i can cover and kind of without my sidekick i'm probably going to shave this show probably about 10 minutes early um because i just i didn't quite uh I didn't quite get enough information there, or maybe I went through it a little too quick, but that's okay. So it's kind of a short show tonight, okay? So uh, I wanted to wish everybody out there a happy and safe weekend and be safe out there. And then I wanted to cover, you know, uh, this show was brought to you by the Talkwad Radio Network. I'm going to end it a little early, so. Uh, it's probably brought to you by the Talkwad Radio Network. So if you want to check out any other shows with the Talkwad Radio Network, all you have to do is go to www.talkwad.com. And that's T A L K W A D.com. And uh, if anybody wants to become a radio talk show host, or um, certainly if I can do it, anybody can. So if you ever want to do that or call into the studio and have some comments or share your views, whether you agree with me or not, it's. Uh, I'm not really partial either way. Um, I think information is invaluable, and it's uh, great to share along with that. So if you want to do that, all you have to do is call is 727-493-2055. That's also the same line that you can call to, to inquire about being a radio talk show host. Um, there's also an application online, too, under www.talkwad.com, where you can put an application in as well. Um, just to let you people know out there, this is actually a worldwide broadcast. It's not the same as a radio airwave broadcast where it's limited to as far as the airwaves can reach. Um, so when you do, when we do it the way that we do it online, it's worldwide. So um, it's it's very interesting. So it's pretty neat the, the the locations and the calls that I get sometimes and and how far I can touch out. So 
And in that conclusion, I would like to uh, tell everybody to have a great night out there. And uh, perhaps next week, uh, I'll post on my Facebook. And if anybody wants to uh, find out uh, the updates, uh, I also have a Facebook and a website being designed under amendment1radio.com. That's usually the one that I pass out there and tell everybody, but it's under talkwad.com. Um, and I'll keep you guys updated on the uh, next events and what we're going to be doing out there. So you guys have a great night, and I'll see you later. Good night. No matter how far to fight for the right without question or pause.